Hey everyone, it's Sarah Threadster, NurseRN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be covering sinus bradycardia. And as always, whenever you get done watching this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this content. So let's get started. What is sinus bradycardia? Well, let's take its name apart. Sinus tells us that we have a heart rhythm that is originating in the SA node. Bradycardia, brady means slow, cardia means heart action. So we have slow heart action, or in other words, we have a slow heart rate rhythm that is originating in our SA node. So let's talk about the SA node. The SA node is also known as the sinoatrial node, and it's our starting point of our electrical conduction system. It is found here in the upper part of the right atrium, and it's known as the pacemaker of the heart. Normally it should make your heart beat at about 60 to 100 beats per minute. It sends electrical impulses down through its internodal pathways, which go to the AV node. The AV node delays signal a little bit and then sends it down through the bundle of his. Then we go to the bundle branches, right and left, and then the Purkinje fibers. And whenever this process happens, it creates that PQRST waveform that you see on the EKG. Now there are many different types of sinus rhythms, one type being normal sinus rhythm. So this is a rhythm that has a rate of about 60 to 100 beats per minute. Then we have sinus tachycardia, and this is a rhythm that has a rate that's pretty fast, that's what tachy means, and it's greater than 100 beats per minute. Then we have sinus bradycardia. So this is a rhythm that has a rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Now as a side note, some sources say that bradycardia is with a rate of less than 50. So bradycardia is a heart rhythm that meets the criteria for normal sinus rhythm, but it has a slower rate. Now the reason it has a slower rate is because the SA node is sending out electrical signals that's causing the heart to beat at a slower rate. Because remember, the SA node should be sending out signals that cause this heart to be at about 60 to 100 beats per minute, and we would refer to that as normal sinus rhythm. But that's not the case with sinus bradycardia. This SA node has slowed down a bit. And there's multiple reasons for why this can happen, which I'm gonna go over here in a moment. But one of the reasons could be that this SA node is damaged. Maybe the patient had a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, and there was ischemia, limited blood flow to that SA node, so now it's damaged and it doesn't beat like it should. It can't really act as that pacemaker performing those 60 to 100 beats per minute. Or the patient is just athletic, they're very well conditioned, so their heart beats at a slower rate. Now as a nurse, whenever you're taking care of a patient and you're looking at their EKG, how can you tell that this patient is having sinus bradycardia? Well, anytime you're analyzing a rhythm, you wanna go through a checkoff list and ask yourself certain questions and use the answers to those questions to help you determine what kind of rhythm you are dealing with. And to do this, you can remember PQRST because that is what we're going to be analyzing on that EKG. So first P and this refers to the P wave. So we're going to look at the three R's of the P waves. We're going to look at the regularity of the rhythm regarding those P waves, the rate of the P waves and their resemblance. So for regularity, the P wave should have a regular rhythm. So whenever you take your calipers and you measure P wave to P wave, it should have the same distance between it. And then the rate, whenever you count those P waves, that represents the atrial rate, you should have a rate of less than 60. And for resemblance, look at the P waves. Do the P waves resemble P waves and are they doing what P waves should do? Like there should only be one P wave in front of each QRS complex. They should be round and upright, uniform throughout. And if you measure them with your calipers, they should measure less than 0.12 seconds. Then look at the QRS complexes and apply the three R's to them as well. Look at their regularity. They should have regularity to them, just like the P waves. And whenever you count their rate, they should be less than 60. This is going to tell us the ventricular rate. And then look at the resemblance of those QRS complexes. Do they resemble them? Are they doing what they're supposed to do? There should be a QRS complex present after each P wave, and they should measure less than 0.12 seconds. 
And for sinus bradycardia, the atrial and ventricular rate should both be regular and they should each have the same rate, which should be less than 60 in order to be sinus bradycardia. Then you wanna look at the T wave and make sure that there is one present after each QRS complex. Then you wanna look at the extras of this waveform. You wanna look at those intervals, like the PR interval. That is measured at the beginning of the P wave and it ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. A normal PR interval should be anywhere between 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. Then look at the ST segment. It should be flat. It shouldn't be elevated or depressed more than one millimeter. And the QT interval should be normal, anywhere between 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. And this is found at the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. Now let's take those questions that we just went over and apply it to analyzing an EKG rhythm. Them. Here I have a six second strip and I'm going to look at the P wave first. So the three R's. First thing I'm going to look at is a regularity. So I'm going to take my calipers and I'm going to go from P wave to P wave and I'm just going to measure down throughout the strip and making sure that they're occurring at a regular interval. So let's look P wave to P wave and they are and that's looking at our atrial regularity. Then I'm going to count the rate. So since we have a six second strip, I'm going to count each P wave, one, two, three, four, five, and multiply that by 10, and we have an atrial rate of 50. Then I'm gonna look at the resemblance of the P wave. Are these how P waves are supposed to look? So there should be one P wave in front of each QRS complex, we have that, and they're upright and they're round. Then I'm just gonna take my calipers and measure the duration of the P wave. It should be less than 0.12 seconds. And here it measures about two and a half boxes, so 0.10 seconds. And I'm just gonna go down throughout the strip and confirm that measurement. Next, I wanna look at the QRS complex, the three R's. So first, regularity. I wanna take my calipers and I'm gonna put one end on one of the R waves and the other end on the other R wave. And I'm just gonna go down throughout the strip, making sure that they're occurring at a regular interval, just like we did with the P waves. And they are. So both our atrial and ventricular are regular. Then I'm going to count the rate. So we have how many QRS complexes in this six second strip? We have one, two, three, four, five. Five times 10 is 50. So we have a ventricular rate of 50 along with that atrial rate of 50. Now I'm gonna look at the resemblance of these QRS complex. Make sure they look like how they're supposed to. We have one QRS complex after each P wave, and I'm gonna measure it. So take your calipers, measure at the beginning of the QRS to the end of the QRS, and it should be less than 0.12 seconds. And here we're about three boxes, and it measures 0.12 seconds. And then I'm just going to go down throughout the rhythm and just confirm that that is uniform throughout. Then I'm gonna look at the T waves, making sure that a T wave is coming after each QRS complex, and here it is, and they are upright and where they're supposed to be. And then finally, I'm gonna look at the extras, the intervals and the segments. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is the PR interval. That's found at the beginning of the P wave, and then it ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. So I'm gonna take my calipers, put it at those positions, and here our PR interval is about four boxes, so it's 0.16 seconds. And then I'm just gonna go down throughout the strip and just confirm that our PR interval is uniform throughout the strip. Next, I'm gonna just look at the ST segment, which is found after the QRS and right before the T wave. And I wanna make sure that that is flat. There's no elevation or depression, it's isoelectric. And then lastly, I want to measure the QT interval. And that is found at the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And I just wanna count those boxes. And here we have nine boxes, so our measurement is 0.36 seconds. And then again, I'm just going to go throughout the strip and just confirm that that is uniform throughout. And based on everything that I, we just asked, our rhythm is sinus bradycardia with a rate of about 50. 
Now, if you find that your patient is experiencing sinus bradycardia, it doesn't always mean that there's something wrong with your patient and they need medical attention immediately. But in some cases, that's exactly what it means. So as a nurse, whenever you see this rhythm, the next step you wanna take is you want to assess your patient. You wanna assess them for any signs and symptoms that they may be having symptomatic bradycardia. And some signs and symptoms can include that they're experiencing fainting, syncope, they are fatigued easily, they're experiencing dizziness, difficulty breathing, they're having confusion, chest pain, or hypotension. Then you wanna look at a potential cause of the sinus bradycardia. And to help you remember the causes of this type of heart rhythm, Remember the word slow rates. S is for sick sinus syndrome, and this is where the SA node is so severely damaged that it doesn't work as the pacemaker of the heart anymore. And this can actually lead to other dysrhythmias like sinus arrest or Brady Tacky syndrome. L is low thyroid hormone, so an underactive thyroid can lead to this. O is for older adult, and as some of us age, so does our SA node, so it will cause our heart to be at a slower rate. W is for weak and damaged heart muscle. And as I pointed out earlier, this can occur from ischemia, from a myocardial infarction that's damaged the SA node from decreased blood supply. Also infection and inflammation like pericarditis. R is for raised intracranial pressure. And this is part of Cushing's triad where the patient, whenever they have a raised ICP, they can have a slow heart rate, bradycardia, irregular respirations, and a widened pulse pressure. And a widened pulse pressure is where there is a big difference between systolic and diastolic numbers of the blood pressure. A is for athlete, their heart is very well conditioned so it beats at a slower rate. T is for toxicity of beta blockers and those are those medications where their generic name ends in O-L-O-L. -L. Calcium channel blockers like verapamil and digoxin are big ones along with clonidine. E is for electrolyte imbalances like severe cases of hyperkalemia. And S is for simulation of the vagal response. This could be an overactive vagal response because the vagus nerve connects to our SA node and causes the heart to be at a slower rate. So if we have an overactive one, we can have bradycardia or in conditions where the patient is vomiting. First, let's talk about the nurse's role. So if you have a patient who's having sinus bradycardia, the first thing you wanna do is you want to assess the patient. You wanna see if they're having signs and symptoms. Is the sinus bradycardia causing them decreased output? It's really affecting them where they're becoming unstable. And if this is the case, you want to activate the emergency response system in your facility, like a rapid response, because you need a team of people to help you provide care for this patient. Because the goal for our patient is to help them get their heart rate back up so they can maintain cardiac output. So you're gonna be doing many things. You wanna look at their breathing. If they're having difficulty breathing, place them on oxygen. You wanna make sure that they have IV access and that it works because chances are you're gonna be giving them atropine to increase the heart rate along with maybe an infusion of dopamine, epinephrine, depending on what's going on with the patient. Placing them on a bedside monitor so you can have close access to their heart rhythm, monitoring their vital signs constantly like their heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate assessing lung and heart sounds, making sure they're not in heart failure. So listen for any type of crackles or extra heart sounds. Also assess for any potential causes of this bradycardia. Look at the medications that the patient's been receiving. Are there any medications on their list that can slow the heart rate? Maybe they're toxic on them. Look at their lab levels. When was the last time they had lab draws? Do they need some? And make sure that nothing is too elevated or too low that could be leading to this bradycardia. And make Make sure you have any emergency medications like atropine and equipment close by. Now let's look at the treatment for sinus bradycardia. So if your patient's having symptoms with this, we can give them medications to help increase that heart rate and make them feel better. So one medication we can give is called atropine. We give this through the IV rapidly, so we push it in, and you can give one milligram every three to five minutes for a max dose of three milligrams. And how atropine works is that it blocks the effects of that vagus nerve. And remember, I pointed out earlier that the vagus nerve connects to the SA node and causes the heart to be slower. However, if we give atropine, we'll block the effects that this vagus nerve can have on the SA node, which will help increase that heart rate. Now, in some patients, atropine will not work. So a patient who's had a heart transplant, it won't work because whenever they've transplanted the heart, what's happened is that that vagus nerve has been severed. So we can't influence that nerve. So atropine can't increase the heart rate. 
Now, other medications that we can give if atropine's not really effective, we can give dopamine, which will help increase the heart rate, but you have to watch the blood pressure with that because it'll increase the blood pressure as well. And we can give epinephrine. Now, these are given as infusions, not like a rapid IV push. So we start an infusion on them, we titrate the medication based on the parameters set by the physician to keep their heart rate within a certain range. Other treatments include a pacemaker, and one type is a temporary pacemaker through transcutaneous pacing. And this is used when the patient's not responding to medications like atropine or epinephrine, and they're becoming unstable. So pacing pads are applied to the skin and electrical discharges are sent through that skin to the heart muscle to cause depolarization of the heart so it contracts and beats. Also, a permanent implanted pacemaker can be an option and this is placed if the patient is still symptomatic and it can't really be corrected easily. So this is an electronic device that is placed under the skin just below the clavicle and it has wires that connects to the heart and it monitors the heart rate and sends electrical impulses to maintain a certain rate so it doesn't beat too slow again. And this rate is set by the cardiologist. Okay, so that wraps up this review over sinus bradycardia. And don't forget to check out the other reviews in this EKG series.